What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. Today we are here with another episode of Get Ready With Me. It's my little book club series on this channel. If you have not seen the first episode of Get Ready With Me and you were just stumbling upon this one, you might want to watch that one first because essentially what I'm going to be doing today is doing my makeup. I will be using the ColourPop Blue Moon palette, which I used to create this blue eye look here, while discussing the second half of A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is a book that we've all read together here on this channel and we'll be discussing today as a little book club. That's what this is. This is my little book club here on my channel. So if you haven't seen the first episode of this and you're not somebody who's keeping up with the books and you might not understand what I'm talking about, so I'll link the first one here on the screen. Essentially, if you haven't read the books though and you just kind of want to hang out and listen to me tell a story about fairies, then I think it'll still be fun for you to watch, even being told secondhand through somebody else while I give like my little commentary on how the book plays out and stuff like that what characters I like and what I think of what they're doing that type of thing after using this blue moon palette today I think it is absolutely stunning and I am a little bit shook that it was only $12 and that blues perform so well these are some of the best performing blues I think I've ever used in my life blues are notoriously really difficult to work with so for $12 I am really into it so I think I'm probably going to do maybe another video with this doing two more looks let me know in the comments down below if that's something you want to see because I don't really have anything else schedule for later this week that I absolutely 100% want to get out as soon as possible. So I might sit down and use this palette again in the next couple of days and do a few more looks. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. One little bit of feedback that you guys gave me on the last video was uh, a couple of you guys said you wanted to hear a little bit more of my take on the book mixed in with the retelling of the story, which I totally get. It's a really difficult thing to balance, but I tried this time to add more of it in. I feel like I have been talking for so long though so I might have to cut a lot. It's very very hard to get the point of a story across in a short amount of time while doing makeup and also like give your commentary on it and like keep those things balanced. It's like a lot harder than I was expecting it to be, to be quite frank with you guys, but uh, I'm working on it and you know, we'll get better every week. You guys seem to be enjoying them so far. So if I think if I could fine tune it just a little bit more, I think you guys would like really, really enjoy it. Uh, I don't know. Let me know down below what you think. Also, the other comment that I got is that you wish that I would say what makeup I'm using as I use it. And uh, I'm going to be a hundred percent real with you. I cannot concentrate on telling the story and also pick up something and say, I don't know, I'm using this and this. I just couldn't keep track of it. But what I'm gonna do is just put the makeup that I'm using up on the screen as like a title card so that you guys can see what I'm using while I'm just continuously talking, if that makes sense. If you are new here, please do not forget to subscribe because I would love to have you around for more videos. Um, a lot of my videos are just regular makeup tutorials. So if you are into that, I would love to have you stick around. Do not forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it because it really helps me out, especially with a new series like this because it lets me know that you guys like this type of content and want more of it. I think that's all we have to say before we get started. For the most part, I'm gonna be using the Blue Moon palette, but like I said, I will list everything that I'm using on the screen as I edit, and I will also leave a list of everything that I use on my face in the description down below. We've got so much to talk about in this book today, so uh, I'm gonna just keep this part real short and sweet, end it here, and let's just jump in and me applying my foundation, because that's where I started. So where we left off was at the end of chapter 23, when we last saw Feyre and Tamlin they were hanging out in a beautiful gorge area and Tamla had gifted her with fairy senses and it made her really exhausted and she passed out in the grass. So that's where we left off. Also, I already primed my face today. I used the Milk Hydro Grip Primer. So Tamlin gifts her with this fairy sight, which is cool because she gets to experience things the way the fairies that she's been living amongst experience things, which is very different than humans because they have enhanced senses. But what it also does is lift all of the glamours that Tamlin has apparently been putting on her this whole time, which stops her from seeing the truth of what everyone looks like and also stopped her from seeing how many of these people live in the manner that they live in. Like she didn't see most of the servants and stuff. The idea being that he didn't want her to see those particular fairies because they're like the least human-like of all the fairies. 
and therefore she would have been like extra freaked out. Alice comes in the room to help her get dressed in the morning and she's like, where is Alice? And Alice is like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm Alice, bitch. I've been here the whole time. Apparently Alice has like really crazy tree bark skin and the whole time Feyre had just seen her as like a normal, like humanoid looking person. So understandably, she's pretty freaked out about that. I understand why Tamlin did it, but also like, I don't know. I feel like he really stays keeping her under a rock about stuff. You know what I mean? Like there's stuff that I feel like he could have revealed earlier. And thankfully Lucian looks the same. So obviously that is very helpful because if Lucian, who was the one she's like kind of gotten the closest with in this whole scenario, had been different, I'm sure it would have been quite a shocker. I mean, imagine like you're just like hanging out with your best friend and you wake up one morning and you go downstairs and they're like exactly the same in every way, but I don't know, they have like dinosaur skin or some shit, that'd be crazy. Lucian also kind of makes fun of her for flirting with Tamlin. He says like, oh, if I gave you the moon on a string, would you give me a kiss too? And he's like kind of being a little bit of a dick about it, but he kind of always is. And at this point, she's starting to really realize and believe that Tamlin is doing all of this to protect her, which I'm not certain if I agree with her assessment on that. But looking back, this does explain why she felt like when she was walking around the gardens, why she was being watched and stuff, because she was. Like there were other fairies there. Next morning, she goes out to the garden where she likes to hang out and she looks up at one of the statues. I believe it was like a statue of like herons and fish or something. And there is a severed fairy head impaled on the top of one of the fish statues. She's shook. Right around the time that she discovers it, Tamlin comes out and he like comforts her and he makes Lucian remove the head. And when Lucian takes the head down, the head has a brand behind its ear and it's a mountain with three stars over it, which is the sigil of the night court. So Farrah is completely freaked that the night court, who apparently are very evil, um, have come that close to the manor and were in the garden and they didn't know and they, they could do this and they were sending a message. Tam tries to comfort her by saying that the High Lord of the Night Court, like this is his sick idea of a joke. Like he's like a sick motherfucker and he probably thinks this is funny and he's just trying to fuck with them because he knows that the blight is growing worse or whatever, which I don't really think is even like a viable reasoning or excuse, but that's what he goes with. But she says, and she's got a really good point, that she feels like it's pretty obvious that they have literally no control over like this evil magic and this blight that he talks about because they still have these masks stuck to their face. And you know what? The girl's got a point. So chapter 25 begins. It's the same day as the head situation and Tamlin gets called away to do some security stuff along the borders because presumably the head in the garden is not the only issue that they're dealing with. That night he actually spends the entire night away dealing with things on the border, which he's never done before, which makes her extra worried. But he sends Lucian to tell her that he's alive. And then she's also very like swoony that he got to tell her that he was okay. She's starting to get the feeling that they have like a boyfriend girlfriend dynamic going on, which is clearly what she wants, whether she has admitted it aloud or not. So the next morning he's still gone and she goes downstairs and Alice is preparing for a summer solstice celebration, which is apparently a totally different kind of holiday than the fire night one that we dealt with the last time. There's no like weird sex ritual in a cave or anything like that. This is just to celebrate the summer solstice in a good, good ass old time. Favorite doesn't quite understand what the solstice is just yet and she is actually very concerned that he's gonna have to bang another fairy in the cave to grow the crops again. Alice winds up ensuring her that that's not the case. So Alice gets her all dressed up for this summer solstice party. She's got flowers in her hair. She's very thin before because her and her family were understandably very hungry and that's why she was out there hunting to begin with and this whole story started but she notices that she's put on weight from being in this more opulent situation and she has like more curves and stuff and she is like really feeling herself about it. And then Tamlin comes home and he's safe. Not only is he safe, but he's completely unscathed, which is very impressive. He's blown away by how beautiful she looks and he takes her by the arm and escorts her out to the summer solstice party. She gets separated from him really quickly. I don't even understand how that happened. It must've been a pretty big crowd. So she goes and gets some 
some snacks at the table and she's like bullshitting with Lucian and she winds up going to take a glass of wine and Lucian is like, oh no, oh, oh no, 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 no. The summer solstice wine is like a hallucinogenic, sort of like euphoric inducing wine. She's like, hey, uh, suck it. And then she drinks it and she, you know, for lack of a better explanation, she starts tripping balls. She really does. It sounds like it's wine made of MDMA. She just wants to dance and everything's beautiful. Like that's basically what this wine does. There is an element of drunkenness to this though, because she is kind of like falling all over herself. And Lucian says that he has to like hold her up to walk her across the room. So he brings her over to Tam and Tam, old Tammy boy is over there just wailing on the fiddle. Apparently he's an incredible fiddler and she spends a, a good amount of time dancing to his fiddling. Eventually he puts down his fiddle and dances with her as well. At that point it's a little bit late and he takes her away from the party and they go to sit in one of the fields and watch these like little spirit things fly by. Apparently every year on summer solstice these little spirits come out and dance with each other and make music in this field and it's really beautiful so he wants her to watch. She describes the song as being like very like joyous and like it fills her up and it's very overwhelming and it's like one of the most beautiful things she's ever heard and Tamlin asks her to dance with him and she's like really? Which I was like girl you just danced with him 15 minutes ago. I don't understand why this is so surprising, but whatever, I'm, I'm not here to judge. She was having a good time. As they're dancing, they're getting very close, and he says, I think I might kiss you, which I'm gonna be honest, I feel like that's the lamest line ever, but whatever, it works on her. And they have their first kiss, dancing out by these fairies. And although I'm sitting here making fun of his choice of lines, it does sound like a very nice scene and it was very romantic, so fair enough. Feyre realizes for what she says is the first time that there are more beautiful things to look for in life and that there's joy and happiness that she never realized was possible for her when she was in like a destitute situation and she used to be very like cynical and grim about it and so it kind of opens her mind and changes the way that she looks at the world in this one small moment. Chapter 26 starts the next morning or should I say the next day at noon because they all get out of bed hung over. Who hasn't woken up the day after a holiday hungover you know? Like she's like full on in love with him at this point or like I don't know I would say at this point maybe lust is more accurate. She's sitting at breakfast thinking all sorts of stuff about his teeth scraping over her skin and like she's she's, she's a little kinky. Their jovial mood from their newfound love affair is a little bit shattered when they get news that the blight is spreading. So that snaps her straight back into reality. She's done floating around the town thinking about Tanlin's scrapey teeth. They get word that it killed a bunch of children. I believe it was in the winter court, which is always a fucked up thing to hear, but especially for fairies because they don't have offspring all that often. Tanlin basically throws a teddy fit over it. And one thing that I have noticed and I do not like about old Tammy boy here, he responds with violence pretty often. As he's having his titty fit, they hear like a deep low sound and then Feyre hears footsteps. So Talon throws a glamour over Feyre to make her invisible and Lucian backs up with Feyre behind him like pressed into the wall so he's like in front of her protecting her and next thing she knows who walks in the door but the guy from Fire Night. The hot guy that saved her from the creeps at Fire Night. So she's really terrified of this guy, which is interesting because he hasn't actually done anything especially scary around her. She keeps mentioning that he's like too casual all the time. So Tamlin greets this mysterious man and calls him Resand. And Resand's reaction is, I haven't seen you in 50 years and suddenly you're calling me Resand, like indicating that that's too formal. There's history, there's some history here. 
So Talon asks Reese what he wants, and Reese said he came to see if they got his little present, meaning the head on a spike in the backyard. This also lets Farid know that this man is the High Lord of the Night Court. So Rhysand kind of starts to indicate to Tamlin that he thinks that he's kind of like being a bit of a wimp and like bitching out on something in a way, but they don't really indicate what it is, which gives you more of a picture that there's deeper stuff going on here with this whole blight and the situation that they're not telling Feyre. Lucian gets annoyed that he's saying this and snaps at Reese and says, you're just Amarantha's whore, which for like a quick second, it seemed like hurts his feelings a little bit, which to me lets you know that there's a little kernel of truth there. Just as Reese seems like he's going to leave, he looks at the table and realizes that there were three place settings there and three people were eating breakfast before he arrived. And he's like, oh, you're gonna try to hide something from me? The High Lord of the Night Court? I don't think so. He immediately removes Tamlin's glamour, which tells you that his magic is also more powerful than Tamlin's. As soon as he sees Feyre, he says that he remembers her from Fire Knight, which important to remember for later. He asks who she is and Lucian lies and says that she's his betrothed, which is apparently a futile effort because as we learn shortly after this, Resent can go into people's minds and read their thoughts and also control them and also kill them and crush them from inside their minds. He asks Feyre her name and Feyre says that her name is Claire Better, even though she can tell that he's inside her mind. So clearly he could just read her thoughts if he wants to and tell that she's lying. Also, at this point, Farah has a butter knife from the table again. I'm assuming it's a butter knife. It's like a table knife. She keeps picking up these table knives so he just knocks the knife right out of her hand, just like Tamlin did the last two times that she did the same thing. So he's got his mental talents in her mind and says that he forgot how easy it is to shatter a human mind like an eggshell. But what he also sees in there is all her lustful, I want him to chew on my neck and scrape me with his teeth and throw me in his bed thoughts about Tamlin. He knows that they were lying about her being betrothed to Lucian. Tamlin legit straight up just starts begging him not to tell Amarantha. Such a strong character breaking down was like very emotional. I found it very like, I don't know, that one, it tugged on my heartstrings a little bit, even though I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't really love Tamlin and I find him very annoying in a lot of the scenes in this book, but I felt for him here and I do feel for him in a lot of different scenarios in this book, but also he gets on my nerves. He begs Reese and he's like, please, please don't tell Amarantha. Please, please, please don't tell Amarantha who is like the high queen, who is the awful, awful evil person who's been the source of all of the blight and the terrible things that have been going on. And Reese makes him get down on his knees and beg him and kneel in front of him that he won't tell. Reese only says that maybe he'll consider not telling her, which is ouch. So chapter 27, Reese has just left. Feyre is understandably completely freaked out. So she runs up to her room and Alice gives her a cup of hot chocolate. And Tamlin has, again, an absolute teddy fit and breaks apart the entire dining room in anger. This is what I was talking about. I don't like that shit. You're 500 years old, bro, grow up. She's hanging out up in her room and Tamlin comes up and he apologizes for the way he behaved. He explains that he needs to send her home because now that Amarantha, who is their tormentor, now that Amarantha knows who she is and that she exists, even though she did give Reese a fake name and Reese seemed to act like he believed that it was really her name, um, she, he knows that Amarantha is gonna send people or come herself to try to kill her. Then he says something interesting along the lines of, didn't you read between the lines today? And she admits that she hadn't. It was very, very clear to me that there was more going on than met the eye. But also 
I don't think that I would have pieced together what was going on if I were her, if I were in her position. And at this point, they're just like all lovey-dovey with each other and they wind up sleeping together in Feyre's room. From the way they describe the differences between humans and fairies, it was actually almost shocking to me that a human can sleep with a fairy and survive it because it sounds like their power, especially like a high lord fairy, is like so overwhelming. But apparently Farrah is a bad bitch, she can handle it. They wake up later and he says that he's going to go back to his room because she'll never get sleep and she has a long journey tomorrow. And she was like, what? And she didn't realize that like it was so soon but he tells her the next day she absolutely has to leave at dawn, like no questions asked. And she has to get in this carriage and just leave immediately. She says her goodbyes to Alice and then when she goes to say her goodbyes to Lucian, Lucian is like pissed. He was begging Tamlin, saying please just give her a few more days, we're so close, can you just give her a few more days? Like meaning like they're so close to something in time. And she catches this and thinks about it, but decides not to ask any questions. While they were doing it the night before that Tamlin told her that he loved her and she did not say it back. So when she's going to leave and Tamlin is saying his goodbye, she's like dying for him to say I love you to her again, which is interesting because you didn't say it back, girl. And then he finally does say it during his farewell to her and then she still doesn't say it back and she thinks to herself that she feels it and she should say it back and decides not to. Which as the story continues will be incredibly frustrating to you, I promise. So he uses magic to knock her out for the ride which she wakes up pissed off about but you know what? I'm gonna be honest with you, if somebody could knock me out using magic every time I had to travel, I would do it every single time. She wakes up in the human realm pretty much already at her family's home. She's like, wow, I know he said that he was taking care of them, but Jesus Christ, like this shit is just opulent as hell. She's so much more like healthy and well-fed and different looking than when she left that when she gets there, her sisters don't even recognize her right away. That's quite a glow up in a couple of months. And in line with her sister's personalities, Elaine is like fawning over her and she's so excited that she's home. And Nesta is just kind of like looking from the side, very skeptical, very, very skeptical, kind of like, mm, bitch, I don't buy any of this. So we start chapter 29 with Farah explaining that it's super easy for her to make up stories about what she was doing when she was with her dying aunt. Elaine makes a note that Farah is like really glowing. Like she looks, she looks, she looks too good. And she asks her if she met a man while she was at her aunt's house, which very intuitive for sure, but uh, it's just, you know, got the background story a little bit wrong still. She takes a walk and goes to see their old cottage that they lived at before she left and realizes how, how incredibly tiny it was. Now looking at it from an outside perspective, she can see that in a way, Elaine was actually much stronger than her for being able to hold on to hope that whole time than she was for being cynical and hopeless about it. After she visits the cottage, she also goes to the poorest parts of the village and hands out little bags of silver and gold to them. She is hanging out with Nesta. Well, I, I would hesitate to describe it as hanging out with Nesta, but she's in the same room with Nesta, even though they may not be like on like casual chill sister hanging out terms. And Nesta straight up calls her out and says, I know that you weren't with our aunt. Ellen's glamour hadn't worked on her at all, not even from the first moment. But yeah, she confronts her and tells her that she knew where she was the whole time, obviously, because she just watched her walk away with Tamlin and there was no glamour on her and she knew. So she not only knew, but had tried to go after her. Although Nesta seems really cold, it's kind of like a protection thing, like a self-protective way of behaving. So Nesta at this point demands that Feyre tell her literally every single thing that happened since the moment she crossed over the wall with Tamlin. So she does, she tells her everything. And she just kind of listens and absorbs the whole thing, um, which is commendable because I might have lost my mind if somebody told me that whole story. Nesta also talks about how she's always hated their father and Feyre kind of asks her why she always hated the dad and Nesta says that from her perspective she feels like the dad 
let their mother die. And then she says to Feyre, wouldn't you do anything to try to save your high lord? And Feyre says, yeah, I would have. But chapter 31 begins and it's the day of Feyre's ball. And quite frankly, it just kind of like glazes over the ball for the most part. But she keeps thinking what Nesta said about how she would do anything to save Tamlin. And she realizes that like, she kind of didn't do that. And the more she thinks about it, the more she realizes that there was more going on than meets the eye. So they're at lunch the next day after the ball and the dad casually brings up to Elaine that he's thinking about buying the better land. And that's when Farrah realizes that she had overheard earlier that a family's house had burned down in the village in the middle of the night and they all died inside of it except one person who was missing. She realizes that that was Claire Better's house and their family and that that was meant for her and that the fairies and Resand had come down to kill her and killed Claire and her entire family instead. Which makes her realize that if they came to the human realm to do that, that the spring court must be in some absolute deep shit. They are in trouble, my friend. And that's when she knows that she's gotta go. She's gotta go back. She tells Nesta to keep everything an absolute secret. So Nesta's like, yeah, totally. We don't need you here, don't come back. And it sounds mean, but Farrah knows that she's telling her that because she wants her to know that she doesn't need to feel obligated to them. So Farrah takes off, she's going through the woods, she's headed north and she's going back to the wall. It takes her two days to ride there and then it takes her two more days to find a hole in the wall that she can go through. She gets back to the manor at the spring court and the front door is wide open and everything is busted. So chapter 32, she's in the house. She's realizing that some real shit went down there. She hears somebody coming. So she hides behind a door in the kitchen area. Turns out it's Alice. And Alice explains everything. What had actually been going on? There was a curse on Tamlin specifically by this Amarantha lady who is the worst. The curse was seven times seven years. For those of us who are bad at math, that's 49. Hamlin and his whole court had to live with those masks on their face that she put on them at a ball. She wanted Tamlin to be like her lover and he wouldn't do it. He also insulted her sister, which is like a deep insult to her because her sister died in the war at the hands of a human named Durian, who we will meet later. But basically Durian is the entire reason why Amarantha hates humans so much. Apparently she really does not like humans, like a lot. Like she really, really, really hates them. And the masks were to hide the fact that she had maimed Lucian's face. So she was the one that took Lucian's eye. The mask got stuck to their face and then Tamlin had 49 years to find a human woman who hated fairies and was willing to kill one unprovoked and then he had to take that woman and make her fall in love with him. She had to say I love you out loud and mean it and it would have immediately broken the curse. The only way for him to get a human woman to do such a thing would be to send his men out, like basically trying to sacrifice themselves and get killed by a human woman, which is how Farah wound up running into Andrus in the woods, thinking he was a wolf and killing him unprovoked. So the masks were stuck to their face as part of the curse because she figured that would make it even harder for a human woman to fall in love with Tamlin if she couldn't even see his beautiful fairy man face. Didn't work though, didn't cover enough of it, girl. So the blight that they kept talking Talking about was Amarantha the whole time. I was like, ooh, he just lied to her the whole time. Like, why didn't he just tell her? But no, no, no. Part of the curse was they physically were unable to speak to Feyre about the curse. They were trying to drop hints around her and stuff and it just wasn't working. She just did not read between the lines, which is really frustrating because it was close. Like I feel like if they did give her a few more days, she would have got it. She realizes that she accidentally doomed all of Prithian. Like obviously it's not her fault. Obviously she didn't know. When Farrah left, it was three days before the 49 years ended. So Tamlin basically sacrificed everything to try to save Farrah, which indicates that I think he really does love her as well. It's not just like him trying to break the curse. You know, Amarantha showed up literally the second, like on the clock, the clock ticked 49 years and she showed up at the manor and she took them all under the mountain. And that's why the house is a disaster. And so Feyre says, Alice, I need you to take me under the mountain. I'm going to save them. 
So that brings us to chapter 33, which is a short one. She straps up with all of the weapons that she can find in the manor, which is admittedly not a ton. She knows that the mountain from the map and the mural that she talked about in the beginning of the book is really, really far away. As it turns out, there are these caves that are like portals, they call them doors. So she could just walk through this cave in the spring court and end up under the mountain. Before she lets her go into Amaranth's court under the mountain, she warns her of a few things. She tells her, don't drink the wine, that it's not like the wine at summer solstice. She tells her, don't make any deals with fairies. She says, don't trust her senses or trust a soul under the mountain, not even her dear Tamlin. But Alice also tells her that there's one part of the curse, there's one piece, that Amarantha still doesn't want her to know. And she knows that she doesn't want her to know because she's trying to tell her about it and she still can't physically tell her that part. Chapter 34 starts, she's in these caves. She's making her way into this fortress mountain Doomville. She very, very quickly gets scooped up by the adder, which was the creature that Tamlin was talking to in the garden that was invisible that day. So the adder drags her into this huge throne room. Amarantha is setting up there. She's like, she's beautiful, but she's not like insanely beautiful. And she looks very cold and there's like something really evil about her. And next to her on like this platform in the throne room is Tamlin and he's just sitting there. And when he sees Feyre, he literally he doesn't even react, nothing. So she assumes that Tamlin must be under some sort of a spell. He also notices that Amarantha is wearing a ring with a human eyeball encased in crystal in it. Not only is it a human eyeball encased in crystal, but it's alive and it moves and it looks around the room. She looks up and Claire Better from her town is nailed to the wall of the throne room. And she is understandably horrified. She lifts up the hand with the ring on it and makes the eyeball look at Feyre and talks to the eyeball and reveals that it's not just an eyeball, it's the eyeball of Durian. She's got his whole consciousness in an eyeball in a ring and she keeps it on her hand and makes him watch all the messed up shit that she does. So she tells Feyre that she wants to make a deal with her, which is right off the bat, exactly what Alice told her not to do. I'm just gonna add some glue to my lashes so we can start trying to get those ready. So Amarantha basically says that she'll give Feyre Tamlin and let her live if she can complete three tasks. Feyre says that she wants the curse broken too so that everybody will be freed under the mountain if she completes the three tasks. Against her better judgment or against Alice's advice, Feyre agrees to this situation. Amarantha also tells her that she'll give her a riddle. And if she can solve the riddle at any time, the curse will be broken immediately and everybody will be freed immediately. But if she fails any of the three tasks, she'll be dead. And if she answers the riddle and answers it wrong, she'll also be dead. And the task will be once a month at the full moon. Tamlin is like a mask of ice on the dais. He does not look at her. He doesn't react, no emotion, nothing. But he looks like she can see in his eyes that he's a little bit horrified that she made this deal. It kind of gives her like a little bit of motivation. Like she's like, all right, I'm gonna freaking, I'm gonna win this shit. She agrees to the deal and then all of Amarantha's henchmen beat the hell out of her. After 35, she wakes up in her cell. She's beat to hell. She can hear people screaming in the dungeons, like being tortured. She wakes up to somebody coming into her cell and she's terrified, but she's relieved to see that it's Lucian. Lucian uses magic, which he has a little bit back of now, and he heals her, but he leaves a lot of the bruises, so it's not super obvious. Lucian though is so pissed that she came back because he's like, you have no idea what Tam Tamlin sacrificed for you to leave. She tries to ask Lucian if Tamlin has a spell on him, but the guards are coming back and he's got to go. So he takes off and just doesn't, just leaves her head. Next thing you know, a bunch of fairies come to drag her back to the throne room. And she gets there and Amarantha says that she couldn't sleep the whole night because all she could think about was the fact that she didn't know Farah's name. She doesn't tell her her name. And then 
and Marantha drags Lucian out of the crowd to get the name out of him, and she calls Resand over. He has Resand capture Lucian's mind and tells him to shatter it if he doesn't tell him Farrah's name. And Reese is like seconds away from squishing Lucian's mind like a grape because he won't answer. And Farrah, to save Lucian, yells out her name and just gives Amarantha the information that she doesn't want to give her. Lucian's brothers are in the crowd. They're they're dicks, they're the worst. And they seem genuinely disappointed that he's not dead. And at this point, Amarantha says, uh, I told you that I would give you a riddle. Now, when I heard this riddle, I felt like I knew the answer immediately. It's not so clear that I felt like I would have just shouted out the answer and risked my own death. My sister also said that she knew the answer as soon as she heard the riddle too and just felt like it was too obvious the answer. So I'm curious if you guys will get it too. I'll read you, I wrote down the exact riddle that she gave her. There are those who seek me a lifetime, but we never meet. And those who I kiss, but trample me under ungrateful feet. At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all of those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft handed and sweet, but scorned, I become a difficult beast to defeat. For though each of my strikes lands a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. So at this point, Farrah hears the riddle and then she thinks about the fact that Amarantha really emphasized the fact that she said immediately when talking about how the riddle would lift the curse, but she hadn't said that when she was talking about her finishing the trials. She starts to get really, really worried that Amarantha is gonna pull some funny shit on her basically. Chapter 36 starts, it's the day of her first trial. They drag her into a huge arena area. Amarantha's there with Tamlin. And within the arena, there's like a big, like a trench and it's like a big muddy hole with like these caverns that go through the mud. It smells terrible and there's like ditches in it. So she says, since you're a huntress, hunt this. And she releases this giant gnashing gnawing worm. She squeezes through a wall. She gets stuck for a second. She thinks she's gonna die in there and she gets out the other side. And when she did that, she accidentally got some like some, some, some room on the worm and realizes that the worm didn't see her go in there. And that's when she notices that the worm is blind. As she's running, she doesn't see one of the huge holes and she winds up like falling in this big ditch that's filled with bones. She's trying to scramble up the walls, but she keeps slipping back down. And one of the fairies that's watching from the outside says, ha ha ha, do you want a step ladder? Gives her an idea. So she starts like punching bones into the wall to make a ladder to get out. But then, then she gets to thinking. So she basically sticks broken bones, like punji sticks. Like she makes them into a trap. And she knows that if she lures back the worm to this spot after she gets out, that maybe she can get it to impale itself on there. So she sticks all these pointy bones in the mud and then she makes a bone ladder and gets out the top. She goes back through all of the tunnels and kind of makes a map of it in her head. And at each corner, she sticks a bone in the corner so that she can grab onto it and whip herself around faster in the mud. So the fairies are all like, what is she doing? And Resand is up there watching and he says she's setting a trap. So she's like, yeah, you know, Reese gets what I'm doing over here. Cause she realizes that the worm must be using a sense of smell to know where she is. So she covers herself in mud like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Predator. She cuts her hand and then she takes off running and it's chasing after her, but she can't see where it's coming from. And from the crowd, Lucian yells out, to your left. She jumps down into the worm's lair where she set the trap, but she had to jump really far because she had to get over the bones, otherwise she would have gotten impaled on them, obviously. She winds up really, really hurting herself. She breaks her arm, she's in blinding pain, but it works. It falls in with like a disgusting crunch and it dies. Most bet that she would die within the first five minutes, but only one person bet that she would win and it was Resand. She also takes the bone that she was holding as a sword and hurls it at Amarantha. And when she looks at Tamlin at the end of the trial, she feels like she sees a little hint of triumph on his face, even though he's still kind of pretending like he doesn't care about any of it. He's really like playing the disinterested card. She is really not in good shape. Like she is, 
injured. Her arm is broken and the bone is coming through the skin. She's hallucinating, she's hot, she's thinking that she has a fever. She's dying for Lucian to come help her and heal her because she knows, like she doesn't want to believe it. She keeps saying that maybe she just has a cold or something, but she knows the fever means that she's probably dying of an infection. Her door finally does crack open, but it is not Lucian who comes in, it's Reese. So Reese offers to help heal her and she says, but at what cost? So he tells her he'll heal her so long as she spends two weeks a month with him at the night court. Wow, that's a big price to pay. He's like, listen, do you know that you're going to die if I don't heal your arm? Because you are, you're gonna die if I don't heal your arm. But she persists. She's like, no, Alice told me not to make deals. I already made one and really kind of screwed myself. So she tells him no and he goes to disappear. Like he just kind of can disappear into the night. As he is like one second away, from disappearing out of her room, she's like, wait a second. But she negotiates it down so that it's one week a month instead of two weeks a month, which is still a lot. He heals her and it hurts a lot and she passes out from the pain. And when she wakes up, he's still in her cell, but not only has he healed her arm, but the arm is tattooed from her hand to her elbow with like crazy like lace-like patterns and the center of her palm has an eyeball in it. And she says, you didn't tell me that this was gonna happen. And he says, not my fault, you didn't ask, which again, Alice was right with these fairies being tricky with their deals. And in her mind, Farah is pretty convinced that Resand did this tattoo thing to get to Tam. So chapter 38 starts and Amarantha had told Farah that she had to do like menial tasks to earn her keep around the manor. And they tell her that she has to scrub this marble floor, it's like white marble, and make it completely clean or they will roast her over a spit. But they give her a bucket of like filthy, dirty water to do it with. So as she's getting desperate, a woman appears. She has like dark auburn hair and she's really beautiful. And she realizes that she is the lady of the autumn court who is Lucian's mother. She comes and gives her fresh water. But the mom did it to thank Vera for helping Lucian and giving her name instead of letting Rhysand squish his mind. They put her in a bedroom with a fireplace in it and in the ashes of the fireplace are just like thousands of lentils. But they also tell her that if the resident of the room comes back and she hasn't cleaned out the lentils that he'll skin her alive. Lo and behold, it's not just any resident, it's Rhysand. While she's in his room, she tells him like, I know you recognized me and that you were lying to her. Why are you playing these games? Like, why would you even do that? And he said that he had his reasons. She also finds out that Amarantha made Rhysand put that head in the garden. He also shows her his beast form because apparently every high lord has a beast form. He grows like big, huge black membranous wings and he has talons on his hands and on his toes. The toes thing really creeps me out if I'm being entirely honest. Like as soon as I pictured that, I was like, Whoa. She also asks him if he knows the answer to the riddle, which is hilarious. The guards come back to get her and Reese takes their minds and basically hypnotizes them and says, you're not to make her do chores anymore. You're not to touch her. You're not to hurt her. And like, if you do, then you have to kill yourself. And he basically says that he did it because he was impressed that she had the balls to try to cheat and ask him the answer to the riddle. So the beginning of chapter 39, she's back in her cell. And now every day she keeps getting fresh hot meals where before she was getting like stale bread and just like old dirty water and stuff. And she knows that it's Reese doing it. But for some reason she still curses his name. I don't really know why. She says sometimes she looks at the tattoo on her hand and feels like it's looking at her. Two female fairies who are very clearly from the night court because they have all of the like shadows dancing around them and stuff come into her cell and they take her up to like a hair and makeup room essentially. They do her hair and her makeup snatch but they take her body and they paint her with patterns that match the tattoo on her arm. Put her in a gauze dress. It, it is scandalous. This dress is scandalous. So Reese appears and says that he did this because he needs an escort for the party. There's a party that night. He pretty much forces her to drink the wine, which is another thing that Alice told her not to do. And she essentially just straight up blacks out. So she wakes up the next morning after blacking out at this party and she's very hungover. She's throwing up in the corner. And by the evening, when she's like semi recovered, Lucian comes around and Lucian tells her everything that happened at the party. She kind of like did like a strip tease dance 
free sand the whole night. Lucian is pissed that she made this deal with Reese because he's like, don't you know that I would have come to help you? She finds out that the reason that he didn't come was because Amarantha made Tamlin whip him for helping her when she was in the pit with the worm. He says, don't you know what Reese is? And she says, yes, I do. Even though I don't think Reese is that. She also gets to ask about Tamlin being under a spell again. And Lucian's like, no, he's not under a spell. He's just like trying to play it cool. And from that point on, basically every night she gets dragged to this throne room where she has to dance for Reese. She does notice that although Reese makes her do these sexy dances, he never touches her. Like he'll touch her waist a little bit or he'll touch her on the arms, but he never takes it any further than that. Oh, he also holds up her arm in front of Tamlin and makes sure that he sees the tattoo so that he knows about the deal. We're at chapter 40 and chapter 40 is the beginning of her second task. The second task, she's brought into an arena again. One of the walls is actually a cage and the other side of the cage is Lucian and he's chained to the floor. Amarantha gives her another riddle, but this time the riddle is in written form. But a little catch here, if you remember from earlier in the book is Feyre cannot read. So there's like a hot, stabby poker that she thought was a chandelier, but it's not. It's slowly coming down and it's gonna squish them slowly into a horrible death. He doesn't know how to read though, so things aren't looking very good for them. Eventually, as it starts to get really close, she just feels really desperate. So she's about to make a, a, what she considers an educated guess. She resigns herself to this decision and she goes to reach for lever number two with the hand that she has the tattoo on. As she reaches for the lever, she's getting a blinding pain in her hand. So she goes to reach for lever number two again, thinking must be some kind of a fluke, again searing pain. She goes to reach for lever number three, no pain. She goes to reach for lever number one, pain. Lever number two, pain again. Lever three, no pain. She looks up at Reese and she realizes that Reese is acting casual as usual, but he's communicating to her through the tattoo on her hand. So she goes ahead and listens to him and pulls lever number three and it stops and they get out. Reese starts talking in her head through the tattoo. And he talks her through like staring her down and walking out with her head held high. She kept it together in front of her and Reese was kind of proud. So chapter 41 starts, it's after the trial and she is in like a deep depression. She's just like laying in her cell. So one day she's like absolutely on the brink of losing it. She's about to break down and as she's laying there, this beautiful music comes into her room and she is like swept away by it. It helps her, it heals her, it gives her like visions of things. And in the visions that she sees in the music, she sees this huge, beautiful palace, like an alabaster palace up on a mountain in the clouds. And she looks at it and she says that she knows when she looks at it, that that's where the love of her life is. That's where she like feels whole, that's her home. That moment in that music and what she saw keeps her going. So chapter 42 is one of the evenings where she's up there with her scandalous dress on and her paint and she's supposed to like dance with Reese and hang out and the whole deal. Reese is pretty distracted with some other fairy that's like flirting with him and sitting in his lap. Tamlin comes up behind her and brushes her hand and indicates to her that he wants her to follow him. So she follows him into a side room, which is just a terrible idea. They walk in there and he starts like, making out with her and ripping her clothes off. And they're like really getting hot and heavy and into it. And as I'm reading this, I'm sitting there going, what are you doing? Are you out of your minds? Like this just sounds like a terrible idea. And the second that he gets some time with her, instead of like pulling her aside and telling her what's going on, informing her of like, you know, anything that she might need to know. Oh, sorry, I had to take a second there. I got so mad at Tamlin that I lost an eyelash. Tried to take her into the back room and get some. And you know what? That, my friends, is a show of character. Wow, what a, what a selfish, dumbass move. Because it would have been really obvious what was going on anyway because of the paint. Long story short, Reese knows what's up and he comes in the room and basically stops them. So Tamlin stalks out of the room. He's all like defeated and shit. And he comes back with Amaranth to cover the whole thing up. Reese grabs her and acts like it was him and Feyre that were making out. But after that all passes, he seems really frustrated with her and he's like, I'm done with you for the night. And he sends her back to her cell. Later in the night, he goes into her cell and she's like, what are you doing here? And he says, I just need some peace and quiet. Apparently, Amarantha was a little jealous that he was making out with Feyre and she was making him 
do things for her the whole night pretty much against his will, which is really sad. But at this point, it kind of comes together for Feyre that Reese has been keeping her alive the whole time, starting before she was ever even under the mountain. So chapter 43 rolls around and it is time for her final task. She's brought into like a big throne room arena type situation again. And this time they want her to kill three fairies. Each one has a hood over their head. The first one is a young male and he begs for his life. The second fairy is a female. And let me tell you something, this girl is a bad bitch. And Feyre hesitates, but the girl literally looks up and nods at her to do it. And Feyre is looking up at Amaranth's throne and Tamlin is sitting next to her up there. They pull the hood off of the third fairy and it's Tamlin. And she's like, what the hell? How is it Tamlin? He's up there. She's toiling back and forth. She's like, I can't do this. I know that I can't kill him. There's no point in any of this. There's no point in living after this if I have to kill him. But then thoughts start coming back to her. And she remembers that over and over again in all of the conversations that she overheard, she kept hearing things about how Tamlin has a heart of stone. And then she also remembers what Alice said about there's one more part of the curse. It puts two and two together that the last part of the curse that she didn't know about is that Amarantha had literally turned the High Lord's hearts into actual stone. But she sucks it up and she does it. She stabs Tamlin in the heart and she hits something super hard and she won. However, she was right. Amarantha was tricking her. She never said immediately in regards to the trial. Instead of freeing everyone, they start beating up Farah and killing her. And Amarantha is using her magic to break her apart. Reese is over in the corner and he's trying to fight Amarantha. He picks up a sword that Tamlin dropped. Amarantha keeps trying to make Farah say that she doesn't really love Tamlin, but she won't say it. As Farah is laying there, she's turning the riddle over in her head over and over again. Answer comes to her. The answer the whole time to the riddle was love. She says it just at the moment that Amarantha breaks her neck and kills her. She's laying on the ground, she's dead. Hamlin kills Amarantha, rips her throat out, sticks her to the wall. She's seeing through Rhysand's eyes. She realizes whose eyes she's seeing through. She doesn't really understand why, but obviously it's because of the bond they have through the tattoo thing. And then all of the lords of the various courts begin to step forward and each of them takes a little ball of golden energy in their hand and they give it to Tamlin. As Tamlin is like holding her dead body and sobbing with it, they give him like this little gift, this little orb of light and it drops onto her chest and it disappears. And then the last one to do it is Tamlin. He presses it into her chest and he kisses her and he tells her he loves her. Chapter 46. Final chapter. Wow, this is a long video. So Farah feels like she's swimming in a open field of nothingness. And the next thing she knows, she wakes up and she's alive. She looks down and something is weird. Like she has her, like her skin is gleaming, stands up right away, realizes that she's not even injured anymore really, except for like a few little things here and there, bits and bruises. And she feels strong and fast and slick. And she realizes that they brought her back, but they turned her into a high fae. Day passes by. At some point, she finally gets to sneak off to a room. Now that Amaranth is dead, they just kind of can go off and like use the rest of this compound until they get out of there. So they find a bedroom, they take some time and they talk and Tamlin examines her tattoo and they discuss everything that happened and they do it and then they fall asleep. Farrah wakes up in the middle of the night and she feels something tugging at her and she knows what it is. It was Resand tugging at her through the bond that they have through the tattoo. And she finds Resand outside on a balcony. Now keep in mind, she hasn't seen the sun in months. He says that he just basically wanted to say goodbye and they chat a little bit. So while she's up there saying her goodbyes to Resand, he, she asks him why he did what he did. Like why did he, try to protect her against Amarantha. He didn't want to go down in history as standing on the sidelines of that situation. He basically just didn't want to be on the wrong side of history. And then he asks her, what is it like to be a high fae? And she says that the hardest part is being a, an immortal 
but knowing that she still has a mortal heart. So she still carries all of the guilt and essentially the thing that she's really concerned that she's carrying with her is the guilt for having stabbed those fairies who were innocent in order to try to save herself and save Tamlin. Rhysand tells her that she should be glad of her human heart and that she should pity people who don't feel anything at all and he just kind of steps back and starts to fade off into darkness which he does all the time she's seen him do that before but this time as he does it he gets a look of absolute shock on his face, literally stumbles backwards for a moment, and then completely disappears. And her and Tam go and leave through the tunnel that day, the one that she came in through that leads to the spring court. And they arrive back at the spring court to find Alice there, just joyously spending time with her two nephews that she cares for, running through the gardens, and Feyre feels really, really good to know that because of her, Alice and her nephews, and in turn, all of the other innocent fairies who were swept up in all of this, get to live a life of peace and freedom. And the book ends with her saying to Tamlin, let's just go home. So that brings us to the end of the book. And like I said in the beginning of this video, I am pretty adamant about the fact that the story really doesn't end here. Like this is just like the scratch in the surface. Leave me a comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on the second half of this book. I would love to know. I'm a little biased. I am a huge fan of Reese. I think he is the best character in this whole book. I think my second favorite might be Lucian, but I would love to know who do you feel like attached to from this book? Because I know I always wind up having like one or two characters that I grow a certain attachment to for sure. So in two weeks, I will do the first half of the second book in this series. I'll link all of the information about that down below. Please don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it because that really helps me out and I super appreciate it. And also if you are new here, please subscribe because I would love to have you around for more videos. I think that is all for today. I literally can't speak anymore because I just, I'm turning into a marble mouth. I've been talking for like four hours straight. Uh, so that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Get Ready With Me and you're excited for the next one. I appreciate all of you and I will see you in the next one.